Well, hello. It's good to see everybody. I'm Dave, one of the pastors around here. Every single week, I start out the same way, and that is I welcome our different campuses that are joining us. And so for those of you who are in Racine, we want to say hello to you. Always good to have you with us. And then for those of you who are in Kenosha, we welcome our Kenosha campus, our online campus. We've got a whole lot of people who every single week watch online, and so uh, we want to welcome you. And then, of course, our Weekends on Wednesday campus, which... At least once a month, someone says, man, that campus always has energy, and it's absolutely true. So here's the deal. We're going to jump right in. If you want, you can take out the uh, note sheet inside your program, and you can jot down maybe different things that uh, you need to make sure your husband or wife remembers. So you can uh, give that to them later on in the week. July 27th, 2016. That was the date Nick Foles was released from the Rams. And it was a negotiated release, so he wasn't all that surprised when it came. Uh, And he had just been going through this season where he was losing more and more passion for the game. In fact, recently in a bunch of different interviews, he admits that it was during this season he thought he was going to totally retire from the NFL. Uh, The Washington Post actually quotes him as saying this, I couldn't pick up a football for about eight months. I had no love for the game, and it was tough. So here's this very talented quarterback. Here is this young man with uh, lots of potential. And he says, I just wasn't feeling it. It wasn't there. And so he took some time off and wrestled with whether he wanted to continue in the NFL, talked with family and friends, and then finally made the decision, all right, I'm going to do it. But nobody picked him up as a starter. He ended up going to the Chiefs, and then he ended up going to the Eagles where he was playing backup. Of course, the rest is history, right? Carson Wentz, the starting quarterback, back in December, he had a season-ending injury. He tore his ACL, which gave Nick the opportunity to step in and lead the Eagles to their first-ever Super Bowl victory. In your face, Tom Brady! Yeah! Now, none of us know what's going to happen with Nick after this season. We don't know what his career is going to look like. But I find it totally fascinating that a guy who was checked out a couple years ago who was ready to throw in the towel, kind of had this second chance at life. He was given this restart. He was given this ability to have a do-over. And my guess is that if we were to kind of have an open mic today and we were to go around and talk about different moments in our life or different seasons of our life, all of us would have moments and seasons that we wish we could go back and press the restart button and have a do-over. Maybe you wish you, you could have a restart in your career. You just say, man, if I was starting out, it would be a whole different career. Maybe it would be in a relationship. Maybe it was in a decision uh, that you made at one time that you totally regret. You just wish you could go back and redo the whole thing. Or maybe it was an opportunity that you passed up. And you said, man, if I could go back in time, I would just restart. I would have a do-over. I would take the opportunity and run with it. All of us have moments in life that we wish we could go back and just do over and have a restart with. And so for those of us who are in a relationship today, I want you to know that's my goal for this series. That this series would give you and your partner an opportunity just to kind of sit back and evaluate your relationship and ultimately that it would give you the tools to be able to restart in the areas that you just kind of feel like, hey, we've gotten off course in this area. And I want you to know this is what my wife and I are doing. Every time we do a relationship talk, every time we do a relationship series, it gives us opportunity to just kind of sit back and and have a restart. And uh, I know some of you, that's going to shock you. Because you think, well, what do you mean restart? Don't you guys just cuddle all day long and read the Bible and pray and skip around the house holding hands? And the answer is no. No, that's not what we do all the time. In fact, last year I was asked to speak at a marriage conference, and uh, I felt a little hypocritical giving them this amazing bio about myself and all this great wisdom that I was going to vomit all over them. And so uh, I came up with a bio, submitted it, uh, thinking they probably weren't going to use it because the other people uh, at the conference actually had these very impressive bios. Uh, But here's the one I submitted, and they actually ended up using it. Dave is the lead and founding pastor of Great Lakes Church located in the tropical paradise of southeast Wisconsin. Dave's never starred in a movie or received a Nobel Prize. He has, however, officiated 150-plus weddings and has been married to his wife, Randy, for 21 years. Also, Dave's style of communication is raw, 
to the point and filled with the many learnings he's been able to pick up from marriage counseling sessions he and his wife have had to pay for. <laughs> so that's a little sample of what you're going to get over the next five weeks. I'm going to just take what I've learned in marriage counseling, what I've learned from some of my marriage mentors, what I have learned from different books I've read, and I am just going to pour it all over you. It's pretty much regurgitation. That's all this is, all right? So here's the deal. Our church is nine years old, and if you've been around for any length of time, you know that every year we focus in on relationships at least for a little season, at least for a little point. And I'm not saying this for hype. I'm not saying this to just kind of get you excited. I'm actually more excited about this series than probably anyone we've ever done. And the reason for that is what I typically do in a relationship series, I try to just pack so much into it. Boom, 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 boom. Let's just keep going through all this stuff. And, and, and our talks will be 40, 45 minutes long. And I get really excited about, it. well, I've decided to do something different this year. What I've decided to do is, hey, we're going to really focus in and zone in on a topic. But then as a supplement to what we talk about on Wednesday evenings or on Sunday mornings, we're going to offer a Facebook live session on Sunday evenings. All right, I'm guessing it's going to be roughly 30, maybe 45 minutes long. And we're wrestling with a, a name for it. I think right now we're going to call it After Hours. Boom, jick, wow, wow, yeah. All right, it's actually not going to be nearly as central as it sounds, I promise you. Uh, but here's the deal. Every Sunday evening throughout the series, two of our staff members, Tony and Michelle Peterson, are going to be hosting this Facebook Live session at 8.30 p.m. Because they got to get their kids to bed first. All right, so they're going to put their kids to bed, and uh, they're going to host this session. Now, if you don't know the Petersons at all, for the last couple of years, they've actually been hosting a, a very popular podcast, thousands of subscribers, uh, called Stay Married Podcast. All right, and so they're going to bring some of their wisdom and experience in that. This is different than that, uh, but that's kind of their background. And Michelle, for those of you who don't know, uh, she actually wrote a devotional last year um, called A Couple's devotional. It's a stay married, a couple's devotional. And it has consistently been on the top of Amazon's uh, uh, rankings. In fact, I looked yesterday and her book is number six in the dating category, which is just a couple spots above Steve Harvey's book on dating. <laughs> yeah, isn't that awesome? All right, and so they're going to be hosting a Facebook Live. They'll be discussing the talk, sharing stories from their own life, answering questions, uh, doing some giveaways. And so if you want to join them at any of the Sunday evenings at 8.30 p.m., just go to our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash Great Lakes Church at 8.30 p.m., all right? Now, I was wrestling over the last week on how we are going to launch the series, Right? What, what are the great words of wisdom that we can start with? And it just dawned on me, the best way to really kick off a relationship series is to just read people's commentary about their own marriage reduced into a tweet. And so I picked up different tweets that were out there, and uh, these are great summaries of what relationships are like. The first one is a tip for all the ladies. It's actually from a woman. She writes, establish dominance in your household by staring at your husband while you unplug his phone from the charger and plug in your own. <laughs> That's good. This next one is just an observation made by a woman about trust in a relationship. She writes, oh, this is a guy. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I cleaned out the garage today. I can only assume my wife's modest thanks, it looks great, is to distract me from the elaborate parade in my honor that she is secretly planning. All right, we've been there. All right, here's a third one. Just got up and got the remote control for my wife. She said it was the most romantic thing I've done for her in days. Very sad commentary on relationships. Here's a fourth one, marriage pro trip. When your wife comes home from the store and shows you what she bought, you better make sure it sounds like you're watching fireworks. Yes, we've all felt that and experienced that. And then finally, here we go. Uh, marriage is like an ongoing tennis match between I love you so much and nobody would find your body. My plan is well thought out. And of course, we've been there as well. And so this whole concept of dating and relationships and marriage is just fascinating. Every single year, I personally officiate between 10 and 20 different wedding ceremonies. And I've got buddies who are pastors, and they're like, ah, it's not for me. That's not what I really like to do. Um, but I actually like to do it because, man, I'm watching something being created. It's like this new family is being born. 
And I'm the midwife, except for I don't have to deal with any of the blood or screaming. It's just this beautiful thing happening. What's interesting to me is regardless of the statistics, regardless of the horror stories, regardless of the endless scandal, scandals that uh, paint marriage in a bad light, couples continue standing on beaches, staring into each other's eyes for engagement photos, still registering for bath towels that match, right? They still exchange rings and have ceremonies in front of friends and family, still eating cake, dancing, listening to 80s cover bands all night long. And the question that comes to my mind is why? I mean, come on, why do we continue torturing ourselves with this very outdated custom that shackles two people together for the rest of their lives? And it finally comes to an end when one of them is standing over the grave of another person. Monogamy doesn't even seem realistic in 2018. There's not another institution, there's not another arrangement that has consistently caused people so much heartache and so much agony as giving themselves to another person only to have that person eventually stomp on their heart and everything starts falling apart. Glad you joined us. I mean, even the Apostle Paul, in one of his letters he writes to followers of Jesus in the first century, he talks about how puzzling marriage is. He talks about how difficult it is to explain. Here's what he writes. He says, as the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery. So the question I have is, why do we do it? Why do we have the ceremonies? Why do we exchange the rings and make promises and sign legal documents? Well, the obvious answer is, well, we're attracted to one another. We, we feel like there's a love and a connection between us. Well, that's great, but for most of history, marriage was considered way too serious of a matter to be based on something as fragile of an emotion as attraction or this feeling of love. In many ancient cultures, the purpose of marriage was, was having babies. The purpose of marriage was to create strategic alliances between families or it was for political purposes. And so sometimes marriage was about security, sometimes it was about business transactions or uh, finding a way to increase your financial power. Mutual attraction, sexual connection in marriage really wasn't all that important until about 100 years ago when thankfully women started being seen as equal to men. And contraceptives started being introduced that allowed for family planning. And that's when marriage started evolving into what it is today, this, this institution where we can love one another and serve one another and be happy together. But regardless of the culture we're talking about, regardless of what era in history we want to go back to, for the most part, people get married for one reason, because they value companionship. People get married because they value companionship. Deep inside all of us, most of us genuinely believe that we're better off with another person. All right, so we want a partner. We want someone to laugh with. We want someone to do life with. We want someone who knows us in a way that nobody else knows us and vice versa. We want to know someone in a unique way that other people don't. And so when you look through all the different books and letters and poems that make up our Bible, you'll see there's this consistent uh, theme that comes across that when two people come together for a single purpose, there's power in it. One of those verses is found in the book of Ecclesiastes. Here's what we read. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. So whether the marriage is based on love or it's based on convenience, the idea is two people are better than one. So if you choose to be in a relationship or you choose to get married, the reason you chose was because at some point you said, hey, having this person in my life is going to enhance me. It's going to make me a kinder person or a more loving person. It's going to make me more joyful in life. I'm going to laugh more. I'm going to be more courageous with this person. Now, I do want to pause here for a moment. All right, because Paul writes, two people are better off than one. And I just want to be very clear. This verse is not to, in any way, discredit those of you who are single. All right, Jesus was single. The apostle Paul was single. 
Jeremiah the prophet was single. John the Baptist was single. Every couple of months, Taylor Swift is single. There is nothing wrong with being single. And so when the Apostle Paul writes, two people are better off than one, what he's saying is, generally speaking, it's better to do life with another person. Because when you have another person in your life, you've got a different perspective. When you have another person in your life, there's support and there's encouragement. And we know this intuitively, which is why we like friendships. And it's why so many people say, hey, I want to be in a relationship where there is this consistency day in and day out. And so we start off our ceremony and we're all excited and we got these big cheesy smiles and we're looking at each other and we're making promises. And then the ceremony's over and we spend roughly the next 30 years trying to live out the commitments we made to each other in the first 30 minutes. And anyone who's been married for more than a couple of years can tell you that's not easy to do. It's difficult to stay close to someone over the course of many years. And the reason why it's such a challenge to stay close is because of something most of us have never thought of. The single biggest threat to every relationship is not what you think it is. Right? It's not infidelity. That's not the biggest threat. It's not financial pressure. The biggest threat is not abuse. It's not dishonesty. It's not malicious behavior. It's not even being married to a Bears fan. That is not the biggest threat. The biggest threat to any relationship is a little word called drift. Just drift. Drift is what happens when the stress of life and the busyness of our schedules and the daily routines that we're caught up in cause us to just drift away and slowly separate from each other without even realizing it. It's what causes our relationships to get off course. And it happens so stinking slowly that we don't see it happening. Like if we're not paying super close attention, we don't even realize drift is taking place. Just last week, there was an engaged couple in Florida who rented a boat from a local marina. They took it out into the Florida Bay and they decided while they were out there on the water, they were gonna go swimming. So they jump into the water And sure enough, as they're swimming, they notice their boat's starting to drift. So they start swimming toward it. Well, the winds picked up, and the boat was drifting faster than they could swim. And so sure enough, the boat drifted away. And then they somehow ended up separated from each other. And so when the rental company uh, realized that, hey, they're not returning in the time period they're supposed to, they did the smart thing. They alerted the Coast Guard, and the Coast Guard put, off this, put out this search. And, and, and sure enough, uh, one of the boats of the Coast Guard ends up finding this engaged woman two miles away from the boat. Then they end up finding her fiancé a half a mile away from her. And thankfully, they were rescued, and everything was happily ever after. But this is a story that repeats itself over and over and over again in relationships. Couples will constantly talk about how we didn't even realize it, but we drifted away from each other. We got separated from each other, and we didn't realize it was happening until it was too late. And the reason this is such a common story, and the reason this is something that repeats itself over and over and over, is because, to be quite honest with you, drift requires no effort. None at all. I mean, you don't have to do anything. Just absolutely no effort. No work, no time, no attention. But of course, we know this from life. If we neglect something long enough, it's going to start to show. It's going to start to rust. It's going to stop working. It's going to become overgrown. After Hurricane Katrina struck in 2005, Six Flags of New Orleans, they decided they they weren't going to reopen. There were lots of reasons for it. They just said, hey, we're not going to reopen. And so they stopped giving attention to the park. So now if you were to go to Six Flags in New Orleans, it's haunted. At least that's how it feels. Everywhere you go, it just things are overgrown. There's graffiti. Nothing's been paid attention to. But rewind 15 years. Six Flags is filled with life. It's filled with energy. It's filled with kids who are smiling. It's filled with laughter. Everybody's having a good time. But once people stopped caring for it, once people stopped paying attention to it, it started falling apart. And when it comes to our relationship, the same is true. Right? When the stress of life overwhelms us, when responsibilities just start to eat up our time and eat up our attention, 
when the daily routines that we go through become the focus, it's very easy to neglect the relationship and to not even realize it, that we're drifting in directions we never intended to go. And because it's so easy to drift, and because it's actually very difficult to recognize when it's taken place, let me tell you what to look for. Let me tell you what you can be paying attention to. It's pretty simple. The biggest indicator of relationship drift is the lack of closeness. That's it. It's this lack of intimacy. So if you feel like, hey, I'm not feeling connected to my significant other in this area, then it's very likely over time drift has taken place. Now, none of us want that. Because if we're in a relationship, we want connection. We want closeness. We want companionship. If we're in a relationship, we want to feel fully loved and valued and accepted by the person we're married to. And so I got good news. Good news is, if you've drifted, your relationship can be rescued. The Coast Guard can find you. But there are five different anchors that you need to put down to keep your relationship from drifting any farther. And of course, when I say five anchors you need to put down, some of you just had an acid reflex. How long is this going to go? Right? Some of you just dripped like a pint of sweat from your body. Your booty just tightened up, and you're like, no! But I promise you, we are going to go through these very quickly, and I will get you out of here on time or within the next two hours, all right? We'll get you out of here on time. The first anchor is the one I'm going to spend the most time talking about. Here it is, anchor number one. If, if you want for your relationship to have some stability, you want to stop drifting, the first anchor you need to put down is emotional closeness. Okay, that's it. Emotional closeness, emotional connection. This is what happens when there's trust in a relationship. This is what happens when you have a high level of transparency and openness with one another. This is what happens when you can be vulnerable with one another and you're not worried about being laughed at or judged by the person you're in a relationship with. Now, the opposite of emotional closeness is not anger. It's not resentment. It's not being ticked off all the time. The absence of emotional connection is just that. It's the absence of feeling anything. The absence of emotion. And this is the reason it's such a dangerous thing. This is the reason it's so difficult to realize when it's happening in our life. Yeah, we may not be laughing regularly, and we may not be showing affection, and we may not be intentional about doing things together, but hey, we're not ticked off. We're not angry at each other. We're not calling each other's names. But if we're honest, we're indifferent. We're void of emotion. We're just kind of, eh. And this is where most couples end up. And so if you want to evaluate, just real, right, real quick, whether or not your relationship has drifted in the area of emotions, you just need to ask yourself some questions. When's the last time we laughed together? When's the last time we actually took time to seriously talk about our hopes and dreams and wishes? When's the last time we had a conversation where we were able to give one another undivided attention? Now, if you can't remember, it is very possible. I'm not saying it's for sure, but it's very possible that you are drifting from one another. So when's the last time you texted each other in the middle of the day just to connect relationally in some way? The Apostle Paul writes this to followers of Jesus in the first century. He says, don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. When you take an interest in someone else, you are putting down an anchor in the area of your emotions. You're saying, we're not going to drift too far in this area. Now, a few years ago, uh, here at Great Lakes Church, we did a couples retreat. And at the end of the retreat, we gave every couple a mailbox that looked like this. And we said, why don't you get in the practice of writing little notes and little letters to each other, and when you do, just kind of put it in the mailbox, it opens up, and uh, you just put up the flag. I cannot tell you how many couples said to me over the coming months, man, we use that thing all the time, it's awesome, my wife and I did the same thing. Like we're constantly using it. And then it just got kind of more and more sparse, it's still in our room, 
It was like every few months, you know, the flag would be up. You know, Valentine's Day, Christmas, uh, whatever. Well, in the last couple of years, it's gotten a little dusty. And uh, a few months ago, I, I noticed that the flag was up. So I was like, well, this is, this is interesting. Um, and so I opened it, and uh, it was empty. So I said to my wife, I said, hey, um, I noticed the flag was up. I didn't see anything in there. She goes, oh, yeah, Jaden, our son, was playing with that. <laughs> that, that. That is the power of our relationship and where it's gone over the last several months. Now, I realize every relationship is different, right? We all connect emotionally in different ways. And so I don't want to accuse you of drifting if you're not. But just do yourself a favor. Just go back and say, what are some things we did in the early days of our relationship to connect with one another? And if you haven't done those things in a while, it's likely you're drifting. And don't live in self-denial. Don't say, well, we're not drifting. If potentially you are. Because here's the thing about drift. It's hard to notice. It's hard to see. It happens very, very slowly. And eventually you can get to the point where that distance has occurred. And you didn't see it while it was taking place, but now you feel it. And there's this absence of connection between you two. And quite honestly, in that moment, you start to say, my relationship is boring. It's just flat. Flat. Not fun. It's like playing a game of solitaire, just me, myself, and I. When's the last time you walked in your house excited because you were going to see your spouse? Now, good news is if you've drifted from one another emotionally, if it's been a couple years since you've written them a little letter and put it in the mailbox, right, you can connect with them. And one of the most helpful ways that I've ever heard of and personally have practiced is what relationship expert John Gottman calls love maps. Okay, here's the idea of a love map. If you're new to an area, if you just moved into an area, maybe you're on vacation somewhere, you get out your, your phone, all right? If you're old school, you get out one of those maps, and you start to look for different things in the area that you're going to want to be familiar with. Where are the restaurants? Where are the stores that I'm going to want? Where, where are the movie theaters, right? You become familiar with the area. Well, Gottman says, in the early days of our relationship, we do that with the person we're trying to connect with. We're asking them questions. Oh, tell me about yourself. Mm, that's good. Tell me more, more, more. Oh, yeah. And then it, finally, we feel like we know enough about them that we stop asking them questions. And we can literally go years without asking any more questions because we just feel like I live with them, I know them. But the reality is nothing in this world is static. Nothing remains the same. Everything is in a state of change. Our bodies change, our beliefs change, our environments change, our abilities change, our level of intelligence changes. So it's possible, right? What's their favorite TV show? It may not be the same one that it was when you started dating. Oh no, it is. We started dating, man, I'm telling you, it was ER. Oh, they loved ER. They love me, and they love Mr. Clooney. Yeah. It's possible. Their favorite restaurant, when you first started dating, might have been the Waffle House down by where your parents live in Kentucky. Great. But it's possible it's changed. Right? What's their favorite store to shop? I know what it is. It's Circuit City. Right? That, oh, they love electronics. Guys, things change over time. So do you know your spouse as they are today? What's their favorite way to re relax? What's their favorite hobby? What's their favorite restaurant, their favorite food? What are they currently stressed about? If your spouse, if your partner, if your boyfriend, girlfriend could go anywhere right now in the world on vacation, where would they choose? What makes your partner feel loved? What makes them feel most appreciated? A love map is not something we have to write on paper, although that's helpful. It's something we store in our brains, and we say, I'm trying to get the facts about my partner. I'm trying to get their feelings. I'm becoming familiar with them. And it's not going to surprise you that the more familiar you become with your partner, the deeper your bond becomes. The more prepared you are for stressful events and conflict. Now, if you want to go to greatlakeschurch.com, our homepage, starting on Sunday, we're going to have resources available for you. You just click on current series, and one of the resources is we're going to have questions that will make it easy for you to just ask each other, All right? Also, Tony and Michelle are very familiar with Dr. John Gottman and his work, and so they'll include this in their Facebook Live on Sunday evening. Now, a second anchor that can keep us from drifting any farther, and we'll go a lot quicker on this one, is recreational closeness. See, every day in our life, we have so much that needs to be done. Chores, job, get the kids here, get them there. 
we got to keep up with the laundry, keep up with the dishes. It's just overwhelming. And if we're not careful, these demands are just going to cause separation between us. And so recreational closeness says, hey, we're doing fun things together. Yes, we have all that junk we got to do. But, man, we're going to do fun things together. Movie. We're going to go to a sporting event. We're going to go on a date night. We're going to do a getaway. We're going to go on a hike together. We're going to go on a walk together. What is it for you that you can place as an anchor in recreational closeness? When we do things together, we enhance our sense of connection. That's why the author of Proverbs writes, A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit saps a person's strength. Daily chores eventually sap our strength. Keeping up with the kids eventually saps our strength. What are we doing to create a cheerful heart? To make sure we're not drifting from each other. And if you say, hey, I want to evaluate, is this an area that we've kind of become lax in? Just ask yourself, when's the last time we've been on a date together? Alone, without another couple, without our kids. When's the last time that we've been on a getaway together? When's the last time we got away from our kids for even one night? Right? When's the last time we've taken a hike together or gone on a movie together? And again, I'm going to say it, I know every couple is different. Right? Some couples are totally fine without doing a bunch of recreational things, but we have to build fun into our relationships. And if you say, man, we, we suck at this. We just never have fun together. I've got a great solution for you. Go and buy a calendar and just start putting things on the calendar where you say, hey, I'm going to write this in. We're going to do this. We're going to try this. We're going to have some fun this year. Yeah. Or we're going to continue to be boring and continue to go through our routines and drift from each other. All right, here we go. Third anchor that we're going to put in our relationship to make sure it doesn't drift any farther is intellectual closeness. All right, this is about, hey, I want to have stimulating conversations. Have you been married for a while? I mean, come on. We talk about our job. We talk about the same old friends. We, we talk about our kids. We, we talk about the same things over and over and over. And if we're going to have intellectually stimulating conversation, we need to do things that stimulate conversation. And that doesn't mean talk about politics. That, that doesn't mean necessarily talk about something that's going to cause tension between us. Maybe it's just as simple as listening to a podcast together. My wife and I do that. We listen to marriage podcasts. We talk about it. Maybe it's an audio book you can listen to. Maybe it's saying, hey, we've never done this, but we're actually going to write out some goals. We're going to we're going to sit down and we're going to think about what we want to accomplish this year. If it's been a while since you've had a lengthy conversation about something other than kids or money or job or household chores, I'm telling you, it's very possible drift is happening. You need to pay attention. All right? A fourth anchor that we need to put down in our relationships to, to make sure we're not drifting too far is physical closeness. All right? This is about affection. This includes anything from hugging to hand-holding to kissing to cuddling to sex, which in week four of this series, we're going to be talking about great sex. And my parents are going to be here. And it's going to be awkward. But they're going to learn a lot. So here we go. Physical closeness requires touch. And touch can communicate acceptance and it can communicate love. Basically, if you think about it, physical closeness is something that we only have with our spouse or significant other that we don't have with anybody else. Right? This is something that we regularly communicate to each other. I want you. This is why the Apostle Paul wrote this to followers of Jesus in the first century. He says, do not deprive each other of sexual relations. Now, guys, if your wife accuses you of never reading the Bible, you need to write down that verse, you need to put it on the refrigerator, and you need to keep saying, I read it every day. <laughs> Do not deprive each other of sexual relations. Now, to be fair, he goes on to say, well, you can take a little time off if it's going to be a season of prayer and seeking the Lord. Ugh. Like, tell me you're ever going to do that. I know you're not. You're not that spiritual. So just listen. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations. All right. Now, again, every couple's different. But when's the last time you genuinely could say, hey, we kissed passionately and it didn't have to lead to sex? When's the last time you just said, hey, we're holding hands together. We're doing something special for our partner. We're showing them physical affection. If you can't remember, I'm telling you, you're drifting and you don't even realize it. And then finally, the, the, the final anchor that we need to put down in our relationships to make sure it doesn't drift too far is spiritual closeness. 
Spiritual closeness just means, hey, we have a shared faith. We're, we're both pursuing God as a couple. If you say, hey, my husband would never do that, my wife, I get it. Not everybody can have this in their relationship. But man, if we could put down an anchor in, in having a spiritual connection, that's a powerful thing. And if you say, well, we, we both love God, we're just kind of lost in how to do it. Maybe it starts by just holding each other's hand and praying a sentence prayer every day. Or maybe for you, it's you showed up to this church and you say, man, we're not really church people or we haven't been to church in years, but man, maybe that's a step for you to be in a place like this together. Maybe it's reading a devotional together. But what we believe about God impacts how we raise our kids, it impacts how we handle our money, it impacts uh, how we do life, it impacts how we treat those who've hurt us, all that stuff. And so why not put down an anchor in the area of spiritual closeness? Guys, drift happens slowly. So slowly that most of the time we don't even realize when it's happening. And then eventually it's too late. We just feel really disconnected and we say, we don't know what happened. A few years ago, you may remember a song that got a whole lot of attention after Christina Aguilera came out and uh, teamed up with A Great Big World to sing it. The title of the song is simply called Simply or Say Something. And it's a simple ballad in which a lover is pretty much pleading with the person she cares so deeply about to just engage in the relationship at some level. And there's so much emotion in the song, and there's a sentence that's repeated over and over and over. It's a sentence that this lover is just, again, pleading with her husband or her, uh, his wife with and just saying, man, I want you to engage. And here's, here's the sentence. It's just, say something. I'm giving up on you. Like, I, I don't know how much longer I can do this. And I don't know how many of you are in that position today. How many of you long for your husband or wife to just engage at some level, to try to show up, to try to connect, to try to engage in the relationship? I don't know how many of you are in a season where you internally are pleading with your husband or wife to just say something because you feel like just giving up and walking away. I don't know what's going to happen at the end of this five weeks, but I'm going to ask you to commit to just keep coming back. Next week, we're going to continue this series. We're going to talk about how to win at conflict without losing at love. But I just want you to keep engaged, keep being a part of it. If you have the opportunity on Sunday evenings, check in with Facebook Live, but let's all use this series as an opportunity to restart our relationship. And if our relationship's doing amazing, then let's use this to add fuel to our relationship because it's already going in a good direction. Regardless of where your relationship is at, I promise you, there is hope. But we need to do something. We need to act. We need to put down some anchors. That's why the big idea for this series is that love is a verb. Love requires action. That's why the key verse is that love never gives up and it never loses faith and it's always hopeful and it endures through every circumstance. So let me pray for you and uh, let me ask that God would help each of us in our relationships to learn how to put down anchors. So Heavenly Father, we just discussed all these things we need to do and the different anchors we need for the different emotions and things we experience in our life. I pray as we leave here today, give us wisdom to know what to do and courage to do it. In Jesus' name, amen.